Well, Moses was minding his own business on this particular day. He was out in the wilderness in a place called Midian, minding his own business, watching his father-in-law's sheep. It was just one of those days. But something is going on. Something has been going on for a long time. Moses, by this time, has been dwelling in Midian for 40 years. His life is broken down into 40-year spans. 40 years in Egypt, and then he killed the Egyptian and ran to Midian. Spent 40 years in Midian until God called to him out of the bush. And then 40 years leading the children of Israel, those Israelites, out of Egypt through the wilderness, finally to the very edge of the promised land. On this occasion, some things have been happening. Moses was oblivious to it. He's been tending the sheep. I have to wonder sometimes if you and I are just going along doing our thing, oblivious to what God may be doing behind the scenes. But God was at work. In chapter 2, verse 24, for example, we find God saying, I have seen what's going on. I observed what the Egyptians have been doing to the Israelites. I know their sufferings, and I have stepped into their circumstance. I've come down, God said. Well, that's encouraging to me because I believe that through this, God is saying to me and to you that our circumstances are observable from heaven as well. But we continue set against that backdrop where God is observing what is going on with with these Hebrew people, these Israelites. Moses working for his father-in-law, who was called the priest of Midian. Now, we don't know whether he is a priest of Midian or the primary priest of Midian, but he's an important guy. Midian, in case you don't remember, Midian was one of Abraham's sons. He was born to Keturah, whom Abraham married after Sarah's death. He had several children with Keturah, Midian being one of them. Now, I cannot even imagine that Abraham didn't tell his sons, all of them, including Midian, about his relationship with God and God's call on his life and how God led him to this area of the world. And Midian taking this, starting his own tribe, which is called the Midianites, communicated to each generation seceding that they were a part of God's plan. So Jethro, who is also called by other names in Scripture, but primarily he's known as Jethro. Jethro... Moses' father-in-law continues to serve God, the God of Abraham, the God of Midian. And Moses 
probably came to know God in a better way through Midian than he had known even in Egypt. For 40 years, he had been an Egyptian growing up in Pharaoh's household. Think about this. God calls to Moses out of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am. God says, I am going to deliver the people from Egypt. So Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And Moses asks, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Oh, I don't know, Moses. Just because you grew up in Pharaoh's household, just because you were adopted as a grandson of Pharaoh himself, just because you know the customs and the language and the practices of Egypt, why would we think you should be the one to go? God knows. And Moses began to argue. You remember that, don't you? Why should I be the one? We learn later that he pulls the, I, I, I can't talk right. And God says, okay, um, let's get Aaron to do the talking for you. Every excuse that Moses comes up with, God has an answer. God's intent is to get his people out of slavery, to free them. That's what God is about. No doubt, as God spoke, the images of slavery and the injustices and the hardships of the Israelites flooded Moses' mind. But that was 40 years ago. It was half a lifetime removed. He was 40 when he killed that Egyptian. And thinking he had done so on the sly with no one the wiser, he felt okay about it, but then discovered that it was known. And if it was known, it was just a matter of time until Pharaoh himself became aware and Pharaoh came looking for him. So Moses did the only thing he knew to do. He ran. He ran to Midian. Now, Midian is located in a part of the world which we would say is the north west part of Saudi Arabia. It is a remote area. It's no wonder Pharaoh didn't find him. Pharaoh probably didn't even think of looking for him in such a remote area. But that's where Moses was hiding for 40 years. But God knew where he was. And God heard the sufferings of the people. Now I have to wonder, think about this. Moses was a child who was supposed to have been killed soon after he was born by the midwives. The midwives refused to do Pharaoh's dirty work and they let the child live. Jochebed, Moses' mother, 
took it upon herself to weave a basket to make it watertight and put it in the Nile River where she suspected Moses would be found and he was by none other than Pharaoh's daughter. That seems coincidental, doesn't it? And not only was Moses taken in, he was adopted. He grew up in Pharaoh's household, as I mentioned. And Moses' sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, you'll need a nurse for this baby. Do you want me to find you one? And guess who she found? Jochebed, Moses' mother. Now, does this seem like a Hollywood script to you? This is like something on Hallmark Channel. God is at work here. Don't you see it? God has planted Moses right where he needs to be. And then Moses took it upon himself to murder this Egyptian and messed God's plan all up. That's what I think. The Bible doesn't say that exactly, but I think that's right. I believe God had a plan by putting Moses where he was. And who knows how that might have played out. But here Moses is, 40 years in Midian, but God hasn't forgotten. He calls him Moses. By this time, the Pharaoh has changed. There's a different guy on the throne. Go back and tell them to let the people go. And as I mentioned, Moses has all kinds of excuses. Now I have to wonder, God being God, God seeing the big picture, God understanding what we cannot imagine, What does God see that I need to be involved in? What does God see that he's calling me to get involved with? Maybe and from pastor in a church. What is God calling you to do? Well, we'll ask that in a moment. For now we see God confronting Moses. And Moses says, okay, uh, let's suppose I do go back to Pharaoh. What do I say to him if the Israelites say, who sent you? What's his name? Now, the, the ancients believed that when you had a name, you had not control necessarily, but at least you had the means by which you could call upon that person. You could get a hold of that person if you knew the name. Thus, when Jacob is wrestling the angel, he says, tell me your name. And now Moses says, if they ask me who sent me, who shall I tell them? And God says, I am who I am. Or it could just as easily be translated, I will be who I will be. Or I am what I am. I have wondered to myself, how 
much did that help Moses? I don't know. It's, it's almost like saying, I'm not who I'm not. I ain't who I ain't. We in our times, maybe you've said it, I have, it is what it is. Well, what is God saying? <clears throat> he is saying this. I am for all eternity. He uses a verb, he calls upon a verb that is similar in form to Yahweh, the name by which God is known. And this is a to be word, a to be verb. And God is saying, I am always. In the present tense, I am. And this is God makes a point of saying, for all generations, for all time, I'm not here just now, but for all time, I am in the present tense. Which says to us that as surely as God spoke to Moses on that occasion, God is here among us. If God can speak from a burning bush, he can speak from a hymnal. He can speak from the scriptures. He might even speak from a person. Yes? What is God saying to us? Well, let's consider, first of all, this burning bush represented God's presence. When Moses saw the bush and turned aside, climbed however much higher he needed to, to get to this bush, he was confronted by the presence of God. Don't come any closer, God said. The ground on which you are standing is holy. It wasn't holy because it was on a mountain. It was holy because of God's presence. God's presence made it holy, right? God's presence. So God speaks to us saying, I am present with you now and always, in past generations, and in this generation, and in generations to come, I am. This means that as surely as God spoke to Moses, God speaks to us. I'm looking for affirmation. Thumbs up. Years ago, when I went to the Baptist Sunday School Board, as it was called then, I was the editor of the Deacon Magazine and a Deacon Ministry consultant. One of the responsibilities I had was to manage something called Telnet. It was a new thing. It was a satellite broadcast for deacons. And I had the responsibility of coming up with the programming for this. And one of the very first programs we scheduled was with a woman named Eleanor Nutt. Some of you may remember Grady Nutt. Yeah. Grady Nutt was, was called the prime minister of humor. But he was a Baptist preacher. And Grady Nutt tragically died in a plane crash, a private plane crash. And we interviewed Eleanor Nutt after Grady's death to talk with her about how God 
spoke to her and through others to her during this time of tragedy. And she said that the presence of people was enormously helpful to her. Not if they tried to say something, but just if they were there. Those who tried to explain why God had done that were not very helpful. But those who simply sat with her and wept with her, she said, were enormously helpful. They were present. And God is present with us. But if people who are present are helpful, how much more helpful would it be if they could actually do something? If there was something they could do about allevi alleviating the pain that she felt. So in this burning bush, God not only has a presence, but we see also God's power. His power demonstrated through Moses to the Egyptians, a power that set the people free. In Eleanor's case, she said that one of the most helpful things that happened was somebody showed up one day. The, the city had decided to dig up her front yard to put in some kind of a pipe. And they just left it, probably because out of deference to Grady's death, they didn't want to bother Eleanor. But one of her church members saw this and came and filled up the ditch. She said, that was enormously helpful. The power to do something. God's power comes to bear upon our needs. It comes to bear on what he calls us to accomplish. Now, some might say, if God had the power to do all of this, why did he leave the Egyptians in slavery so long? Well, actually, I don't know the answer to that. But I have some suspicions. First, consider... Moses took matters into his own hands. Maybe it wasn't God's plan to wait so long. So sometimes our suffering is a result of choices we or others make. And we suffer the consequences. Another possibility is before God can change our circumstances, sometimes he has to change something or someone, maybe even us. Maybe, maybe God was at work making some changes. Maybe God was preparing the Israelites. Maybe he was preparing the Egyptians or Pharaoh or maybe even Moses. But God was acting to bring about his will. Or it may be that God sometimes allows us to go through things so we ourselves are equipped to help others go through those things. I heard Rick Warren once say, God has us go through things we're going through so we can help others get through what they are going through. I think there's some truth to that. But God's presence 
was in the bush. God's power was in the bush. And we find his purpose coming out of that encounter with Moses as well. God wanted his people to be free. Guess what? He still wants his people to be free. At this point, I want to use the words of a black preacher, J. Bernard Taylor. He said, what is your Egypt? Are you in Egypt today? You can be set free from whatever Egypt has you bound. God wants you free. God wants you out of Egypt. Get out of the Egypt of fear or out of the Egypt of guilt, out of the Egypt of doubt. Get out of the Egypt of failure. Get out of the Egypt of weakness. Get out of the Egypt of insecurity or disbelief. Get out of the Egypt of tradition. Get out of the Egypt of burdens. God wants you out of any and every Egypt that has you bound. Get out. You have something you need to get out of Egypt. In fact, you have everything you need. What is the probability of your getting out of your Egypt? The probability is up to you. It's up to you if you will get out of your Egypt. But God stands ready with you, beside you, in you, to help you. Moses accepted God's call to return to Egypt and to speak out against the oppression of his people. Would this Pharaoh remember him? When he showed up, would he be arrested? Would he be killed? He didn't know. But he believed in God's purpose, ultimately. He believed in God's purpose. He accepted the challenge and took the chance. And the rest, as they say, is history. What courageous action is God calling you to? 